this video is going to cover some of the basics of electrostatics as far as positive charges, negative charges, things like that. Also, a lot of this I'm hoping that you have learned before in chemistry as well. So hopefully for some of you this will be a review. So as when we talk about atoms, there are two different models pictured here of an atom. A little bit more old-fashioned model might be called the Rutherford model. Um, it's showing that each electron is in a specific orbit around the nucleus, which is the neutrons and the protons. A little bit more modern version is the electron cloud model um, because the way the Rutherford system appears, it appears as though these are in a fixed orbit specifically going around. And that's not really the case. It's a lot more random than that. And so this electron cloud shows us that these electrons might be kind of vibrating, moving around. They're not specifically in a straight line around there. There is a lot of movement and um, even a little bit of probability involved when you get into the electron cloud model, and that's a little bit more accurate. But in any case, we need to understand that the protons have a positive charge, and they are located in the nucleus. We also have the neutrons. Neutrons are neutral. They don't have any charge, and they are also located in the nu nucleus. So the nucleus is created as formed out of the protons and the neutrons. Then the electrons, they have a negative charge, and they are going around the outside of the atom. And they are extreme, they are really far away. Uh, we'll, we will get into exactly how far away they are, but they are not, I mean, when we have these diagrams, they look like they're pretty close. That's not how they are. They're much farther away. So they are far away from the outside, but they all work together. They're positives. The protons, the neutrons, and the electrons all work together and um, balance each other out, essentially. When we talk about protons and neutrons, because we're going to talk about movement and specifically electrons, how the electrons are moving, the protons and neutrons really cannot move without the atom itself moving. So the whole atom can move, and in that case, the protons and neutrons move. But otherwise, they cannot, you can't separate out a proton or a neutron. Because they essentially, they are the atom. They make up the nucleus. They are the main thing of the atom. They cannot move. The electrons, however, are capable of moving from one atom to another. And they frequently do this. They jump around. And electrons, they are, because they are so far away, they're actually pretty easy to pluck off. And that's what we investigated in our lab the other day, is the electrons can jump around very easily. They are so far from the nucleus that it's, it's really easy to pluck some off here and there. So they will be plucked off. The electrons will move frequently. And so usually when we talk about electrostatics, we're talking about the electrons, typically not the protons and neutrons, because they really don't move. Electrons can move freely in conductors, which is mostly metals, but they have restricted motion in insulators. And insulators is just like what you think of insulators being. Um, plastic, styrofoam, wood, things like that. Things that, as, just as we conventionally think of things being insulated, that's the same thing we're talking about with insulators. So electrons, don't, they don't have as much movement in insulators. But in metals, they jump around pretty easily. Now in this class, we don't talk much about magnets, but a lot of the concepts that we're going to deal with in this unit are going to be similar to concepts that you'll be familiar with in magnets. So for instance, when we talk about charge interactions, like charges repel and opposite charges attract, just like you have in magnets. Only now we're not dealing with we're not dealing with those magnets, we're just dealing with charges. And, but they, they react a lot of the same ways that magnets do, so it's, it's a helpful analogy sometimes. Electrons in conductors will move from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. So if you think back to the diagram, this electron cloud model, these electrons can move if 
if it's getting kind of too crowded over here with electrons, then they can all move to the other side or they can spread out more to the other side. So the electrons within the cloud, the electrons can move around and they will do that to find some equilibrium, to move from areas of high concentration to low concentration. Okay, let's talk about charges. A charge is to electricity as mass is to mechanics. In other words, when we talked about, I don't know, we're talking about dynamic forces or we're talking about kinematics or anything like that, we talked a lot about mass earlier this semester. All semester long we've been talking about mass. It's kind of the most basic part of mechanics. Now we're going to move over and talk about charge. And charge is the most basic form of electricity. And it is also quantifiable. In other words, it has a number associated with it. Just like mass, we talk about 5 kilograms, 10 kilograms, etc. Charge is the same way. We can give it a quantity. And that is measured in coulombs. Coulombs is abbreviated with a capital C. And again, it is quantized. That means there is a specific number associated with it. When we talk about charges, there is an elementary charge, and we use the E for the elementary charge, and that is the amount of charge on an electron or proton. And that specific number is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. That is not something you need to memorize. That's something that does appear on your AP sheet, and we can look at it in class to find where it is, but that is on the sheet. You don't need to memorize that. But that's how much charge a single electron or proton has. And because we can't break down an electron or break down a proton, that charge comes in chunks of E that can't be further broken down. So we can talk about something that has a charge of 2E, but we can't say it has a charge of a 1 half E or a 0.2 E or just some random number. There are no random numbers of charge. They are all in chunks of 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. Now in this class, we're not going to be talking about microscopic things. In chemistry, you talked a lot about microscopic, microscopic things. In this class, we're going to be talking about macroscopic. In other words, larger things that, um, that we can see, at least. Uh, and then we're going to be talking about the charges basically upon those larger objects, those macroscopic objects. We have macroscopic ob objects, and they can be considered negatively charged when they have more electrons than they have protons. They are considered positively charged when they have more protons than they do electrons. And they are considered neutral when they have the same number of electrons and protons. Now just keep in mind that whatever this object, this macroscopic object is, some sort of a sphere or a rod, anything that we deal with in the physics classroom. Remember, the electrons can move around. The protons don't really. But thinking back to your chemistry, the protons, you know, you've got all these protons together in the nucleus, and then you have these electrons on the outside, and those electrons can be plucked off. And so in the same way, we can have several protons on a certain object and then each of those has its electrons in orbit around it and those electrons can move. The electrons will move, the protons will not move. And then if they have the same number of electrons and protons then that object is considered neutral. Now we can change the charge of an object by doing different things. One thing we can do is we can charge it by friction. We did that in our investigation. We can rub a piece of fur on a rod and that's going to give it a charge, either add electrons on, giving it a negative charge, or take electrons off, giving it a positive charge. And so if one object has a higher electron affinity than the other, it will take electrons and become negatively charged. And then the object that loses electrons will become positively charged. And again, that's what we experimented with in our lab as we were rubbing those objects together, rubbing the silk on top of the glass or what have you. And we looked at that list of which things have more affinity, which one will take 
electrons, which ones will give electrons. But rubbing things together is not the only way to charge something. We can give it a charge through other methods as well. And we have two methods to do that. One's called conduction and one's called induction. With conduction, it occurs through direct contact. That means two objects are touching each other. And when they touch each other, those electrons can pass through and go one way or the other. If we're doing conduction, then that is the idea that an object with a net charge is brought into an object with a neutral. And when that happens, the electrons are going to move from one material to another from a high density to a low density. In the end, both objects are going to end up with the same type of net charge because they like to find this equilibrium. So as an example, let's say this is your charged rod. You're going to touch it onto another object. And when you do that, the electrons are going to move back and forth and create a state of equilibrium where they're going to have equal charge. That is conduction. when We touch things to each other. We also have something called induction. And that occurs when objects don't touch each other. So you could have, again, your sphere and your rod, and one of them might be charged and one of them might be neutral. And when you do induction, the electrons can actually do two things. For one, even though they're not touching each other, they can create a positive or negative imbalance, basically. They can move the charges around a little bit. And so when you do that, that allows you to then take it a step further and do, you know, get rid of some of the charges and so forth. But induction occurs when you, they don't touch each other, but it separates the charges due to electrostatic attraction or repulsion from an outside object with a net charge. Okay, so let's say that this has the same number of electrons as neutrons. This is a neutral object. I just put in there five positive charges and five negative charges. All right, if we bring a negatively charged rod nearby, well, what's going to happen? If this has negative charges on it, it's going to repel these negatives and these negatives these negative charges are going to move to the other side. They're going to, they're still connected with their proton, but they're going to move to the other side and move farther away because they don't want to be close to these other negative charges. So this negative rod is going to create an imbalance and put all the negative charges on one side as far away from this rod as they can get. So that's our second bullet point here. They're going, there's going to be a separation of charges on an object due to electrostatic attraction or repulsion from an outside object. That's the rod. What this does is it creates a dipole. So if these couple of items, I'm going to move them over here, those electrons are going to move to the other side. So I'm just going to erase these couple of these two because they're the closest ones and I'm going to move them over to the other side because they want to get farther away from this. And so basically in the physics world, what we do is we end up, we end up kind of redrawing this. So I have my five and five, but what's going to happen, the way we represent this is we say there are all the positive charges are on this side, all the negative charges are on this side. Now, that's how we're going to represent that. I understand that in chemistry it might look a little bit different, but this is how we're going to represent it because all of those negative charges are going to want to get far away from this rod, and so they go as far away as they can. That is called a dipole. A dipole is when you have an object which has positive charges on one side, negative charges on the other side. Then, if this object, which is neutral, but yet it is a dipole, if it is grounded during induction, the two objects will have opposite types of net charge. So by grounded, we're going to talk about grounded in just a second here. Um, 
By grounded, we mean if it is basically connected to the ground somehow. And so it can just touch directly onto the ground, or sometimes we can connect like a wire, for instance, and we use this little kind of arrow notation to show it's connecting to the ground. If, if that happens, then all of these negative charges are all going to jump off and they're going to travel down to the ground. And then if you cut that wire, that grounding wire, then what you're going to be left with is all those negatives have now gone away. All those negative charges took off. And then you cut it off and now we have a positively charged item. And all of that happened without ever touching each other. We never touched it, but yet all of the negatives were pushed over to that side. We grounded that side, and so all the negative charges jumped off and jumped onto the ground, essentially. The ground is considered a basically like an endless supply of electrons, that it can take electrons or give electrons. Um, if something needs to be neutralized, uh, like for instance, if we, if we now, this is kind of getting advanced, but if we now took this rod away and we reconnected the grounding wire, this would become neutralized again. It would gain electrons again so that it would be neutral because it wants to be in that state of of equilibrium so it would take them on so the ground is an endless supply of electrons it can take electrons and it can give electrons all right let's talk about grounding now uh, we've been kind of alluding to it but grounding is when you take an object with a net charge and it's connected to the ground or a very large mass via a conducting material and so then electrons flow onto or off of the charged object, come causing it to become neutral. And so because the ground, I mean, the Earth is so huge and so massive compared to whatever object you're putting on it, that it can take electrons or give electrons because it's almost an infinite, um, infinite supply of electrons. All right, on the rest of the page, there are a couple of different diagrams that I want to kind of talk you through. And so the first one is this one in the margin, and this is found in page 526 in the textbook. It goes through the process of charging a metallic object um, by conduction. Conduction is when you do it by touching each other. You have this sphere. It is neutrally charged. If you count it up, it should have the same number of electrons as protons. However, if we bring this negatively charged rod, what's going to happen is it's going to push all of the electrons to the other side. And that leaves us with a majority of positive charges on the left side and a majority of negative charges on the right side, essentially a dipole. If we touch the rod to the sphere at this point, the electrons are actually going to jump off of the rod and jump into the sphere. And the reason is, they don't have them shown here, but just like these positive charges were here, it's got all these positive protons here. So the negatives are going to jump in to basically create equilibrium with those. So we're going to be adding some electrons through this negatively charged rod, adding them onto the sphere. So it's neutralizing the lo local area, and yet we still have all of these negative electrons over here. Then we take the rod away, and when we move the rod away, we have too many electrons, too many negative charges. We still have those positive charges. They didn't draw them in here, but they, we still have the positive charges in here. But we've ended up with a net negative charge because we brought more negatives onto it to neutralize that area, but yet we had all of these negative charges still there. And so we have more electrons than we do protons, and so now we have a negatively charged sphere.
is how you would charge something through conduction, that is touching it. Diagram that's in the main portion of the notes over here. Again, it comes from your textbook, page 527. So both of these are worth your while to go back and look at the textbook and read about them. But here we ha I've just cut and pasted out of the textbook this material for you. Okay, this is going to be charging by induction. That is, we're not even going to touch the rod. We can do all of this without touching the rod. And so what we do is we have this sphere. It is neutral, has a neutral charge, has an equal number of positive and negative charges on it. We're going to bring our negatively charged rod. When we bring that negative rod over, it's going to repel the negative charges over to the right-hand side to get away from the, positive charges, uh, the negative charges over here. So all of our electrons are going to fall over here. Notice the protons aren't really moving. In the last diagram, I think they didn't do a good job of continuing to show those protons. They kind of dropped off the protons. But notice the protons aren't really moving. It's the electrons that are moving. So the electrons redistribute because they don't like that over there. They want to get away from it. It's repelling them. So they come over here. While that is still in place, the negatively charged rod is still in place, we connect a grounding wire. The grounding wire allows these negatives to get off. They want to get, they're, they're wanting to get off because they want to get as far away from that negative as they can. So those electrons are pushing these others off. So those electrons jump off. We disconnect the wire, the grounding wire. And when we disconnect that grounding wire, we are left with fewer electrons than there are protons. We've lost electrons, thus leaving us with an excess number of protons. Take the rod away and they all redistribute, but you can see, again, those protons, same number of protons we had before as were the very, very beginning, but now we have fewer electrons because we lost some electrons through the grounding. And yet all of that happened without ever touching the actual rod. The sphere and the rod never touched each other. So we will try to investigate some of these in class. Some of them we can do physically, that is we, we have some materials that we can look at and see what we do that. Some of them might just be more um, interactive things like um, interactives on fat or physics classroom, things like that. But these are two different ways to charge an object, one through induction, one through conduction. And again, found in the book, I encourage you to look at those pages in the book to read more about this process.